Kiyoki Chapel's worship. I'm Mert Shane, pastor here at historic Kiyoki Chapel, and it is a delight to be with you today. In the way of our announcements, uh, today is Human Relations Sunday, and so we recognize uh, this particular Sunday because it's one of six special Sundays in the United Methodist Church. And so a offering which goes towards scholarships and and the work in human relations uh, is appropriate for today. And so I ask you to give as you can uh, for this special Sunday. Also, along those lines, uh, the General Commission on Religion and Race is offering several workshops online. Uh, there's an Anti-Racism 101 required skills for white people who want to be allies. And also, uh, you were here, first steps for white Christians on race and racism. And so I suggest that uh, if you are truly interested in the cause, if you want to be more knowledgeable uh, relative to the issue of racism, I would strongly recommend going to uh, the General Commission on Religion and Race, their online services. And so let us begin with our worship. We are individuals. We are a community called of God. We gather to worship at God's bidding. We are individuals and we are a community called by God. We gather to listen for God's fresh speaking of the Word. We gather in preparation of being sent to do God's bidding. Let us pray. Loving God, your Spirit calls us together this day to worship your name. Be filled with your Word and be equipped to serve you. Help us. Leave our cares and worries at your feet, that we might attend fully to your presence with us today. May our worship glorify you and bring us closer to your loving Son, Jesus our Lord. Amen. And now, I would like for the children, our child, to come up. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for you today. And maybe you can help me out. What are some ways that we share good news with other people? Well, we can call them on the phone. Yeah. We send emails. Mm -hmm. And what else do you send me? What do you usually do? Emojis? Yeah, you send me text messages of emojis. And those, and we send letters to people. Those are just some of the possibilities of how we share with other people the good news. Well, there are many ways that we can deliver a message. Sometimes we do it on television. Sometimes we do it by music. Sometimes we do it by the radio. There are all kinds of ways that we can share good news with others. Well, today, um, the Bible has many messages about God for you. And so, huh, I'm getting a phone call. Hello? You need to tell me something? But I'm right in the middle of the children's sermon. Can I call you back later? Oh, it's very important. You want me to share with the children this message? 
What's the message? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. That's all? Bye. That's amazing. That was the same Bible verse I was going to read to you. Well, let's pray. Creator God, open our ears so that we can hear the good news of your love for us. Amen. Thank you. There are several key prayers that we want to lift up today. Um, and so the first prayer I want to lift before you on this uh, weekend that we recognize Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And we also recognize the fact that uh, an inauguration, a transition of leadership is going to take place. And so let us pray for our leaders. O oh God, as you anointed leaders and called prophets of old, lead us to recognize our true representatives and authentic leaders, men and women who love your people and can walk with them, who feel their pain and share their joys who dream their dreams and strive to accompany them to their common goal. In your fire, with your spirit, embolden and commission us to transform our political system, to serve your people, and to bring real glory to your name. Amen. And now, let us pray our pastoral prayer. Won't you join me in prayer? God of all creation, your works sing your praise. And we, your people, join the chorus. We beg for your healing touch to fill the cracks where we have damaged what you declare very good. We ask your sustaining presence for those who are ill, troubled, and in grief. And so we continue to lift up Linda and her physical difficulties, for Carolyn and her family as they grieve the loss of her nephew, for healing powers for Pat as she has sustained this injury. We ask for your peace where violence reigns, Please grant wisdom, love, and grace to this congregation that we may spread the gospel of Jesus, love, and forgiveness wherever we go. We come to you, God, praying for unity among Christ's disciples and among all the people of the world. Help us to answer the call of Jesus Christ, even as the original disciples were forged into effective witnesses of the gospel. Strengthen our resolve to move past our differences to the great message of hope and salvation that we share in Christ. Bless us this day as we encourage, are encouraged to examine our call to discipleship, 
may we join all other Christians lifting up your name and praise and honor. Oh God, we, you call and call our names. There are times that we, like Moses, make excuses and ask not to serve you. There are times that we, like Jonah, say we will serve, but then turn and go the other way. There are times that we, like Samuel, hear your voice, but lack the knowledge to follow your call. Help us recognize your voice in our lives. Give us the eagerness of Samuel to jump up even in the middle of the night to respond to your call. Forgive us when we ignore you or make excuses. Work in us a willing spirit. We pray in the name of the one who calls us, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. that we have received and your offerings that we have received or that you are sending in. Let us give thanks and praise. Let us pray. Creator and sovereign of all things and all people, you bestow your generous gifts upon us. All about us we see evidence of our riches in comfort in goods and in money. Help us to be generous with those riches, even as Samuel was willing to give of what he had for the good of others. Through our generosity, may we grow in wisdom, in stature, and more in accord with your will. Amen. Hello. Our gospel lesson today is John 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found what Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite, in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe 
because I told you, I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now I would like to introduce our guest speaker for today. The Reverend Dr. Andrew Foster III, who is the district superintendent for the East District. And he's going to bring a special message to us today on this Human Relations Sunday. Uh, welcome him as he gives his message of hope to you. May God bless you and keep you in all that you do, both this day and always. Amen. Good morning, Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference. I'm the Reverend Dr. Andrew L. Foster III, District Superintendent of the Excellence Focused East District. Today is Human Relations Sunday, one of six Sundays we as United Methodists observe throughout the calendar year. These special Sundays are designated as reminders of our connectional nature. It provides each local church an opportunity for giving outside of the local church walls. On these Sundays, we empower our congregations to give toward causes and organizations that promote sustainable life changing. These offerings help offer refuge in times of disaster, promote peace and justice, provide scholarships, reach out to the community, teach skills to encourage self-sufficiency, and share the love of Jesus Christ with God's people everywhere. Human Relations Day is another opportunity to recognize that Jesus is not relegated to the walls of the church. It is a reminder that our buildings are not the church, the people are the church. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, there was a time when the church was very powerful and the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Listen with me to the word from the prophet Samuel as recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 through 10 reading from the New Living Translation. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied. What is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did, did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. Verse 8. So the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to Samuel, Go and lie down again, and if someone calls again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. And the Lord came 
and called as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, Speak, your servant is listening. God's word for God's people. Amen. I wonder if you will pray with me and for me on a sermon lesson entitled, Are You Listening? Let us pray. Speak, Lord, for we, your servants in Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference, are listening. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our several hearts always prove to be acceptable unto you, for you are indeed our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You probably remember the commercials where the Verizon guy with the glasses and the short black hair walks around checking the strength of the signal on his cell phone. He keeps asking the question, can you hear me now? Good. The point of the commercial is to emphasize how good Verizon signal strength is when it comes to cell phones. It amazes me, however, that the same guy now works for Sprint. Well, here's a question for you. As this new year is already underway, how good is your spiritual strength, your spiritual signal strength, when it comes to hearing from God? Do you have an open line of communication with God? Are there dead spots? If you were to rate your communication with God, how many bars would you give it? Two bars, three bars, four bars, or none? If God was trying to get through to you, would he be able to say, can you hear me now? Good. This passage in 1 Samuel marks the transition from a lifetime when Israel was not hearing from God to a time when God, his word came really and freely to all of Israel. And that difference came about through God's call of Samuel as a prophet. So let's take a look at this passage together and see what we can learn about hearing from God, especially as we look at Samuel and Eli's place in this story. I am truly convinced that every single one of us has a call on our lives. It may not be a call to preach or to teach or to lead, but all of us are created by God for a purpose. In our selected passage of scripture this morning, young Samuel was uncertain at times of his calling. He was like most preachers and prophets if they are truly honest. They really did not want to acknowledge the call on their lives to serve. The calling of Samuel follows the revoking of the calling of Eli's family. Eli belonged to the tribe of Levi and for years acted as a judge and as a high priest in Israel. God calls many different people at different times, different ways and at different places and for different reasons. In the cool of the afternoon, God called Adam after he disobeyed his command not to eat from the tree of life. God called Cain after he killed his brother Abel. God called Noah after he saw that man was evil on the face of the earth and told him to build an ark. God called Abram to leave his country and his family and go to a strange land, God also called Moses from a burning bush to go and free his people from slavery. Which brings us to our text today. God called Samuel. When he woke up, he thought it was Eli. So thinking it was Eli, he ran to him and said, here I am, you called me. Eli told him, I did not call you, go back to sleep. This happened three more times. At the third time, Eli realized that it was a divine call from God. So he told Samuel to go and lay down. And if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel did as Eli instructed him. And the Lord appeared and called Samuel as he did before. And he said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. The Lord told Samuel his plans. 
He said, see, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. Verse 12 says, at that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrificing or by offering. After hearing all that the Lord had to say, what did Samuel do? He lay there till morning, probably in shock and awe and possibly wondering what he should say to Eli the next day. Naturally, he would be afraid to tell Eli the vision. But at daybreak, he could have bounced out of bed and, and start bragging to everyone that God spoke to him last night. Or he could have gotten up early and eagerly waited outside to tell Eli that he had he had his he and his sons were getting just what they deserved. No, he didn't do anything like that. He did not do anything out of arrogance or spite. That was not his mannerism, or as some might say, that was not his nature. No, he would not have acted proud or puffed up because of the honor that was given to him. What he showed was great humility. He was honored that God had chosen him above all the children of the nation. So what he did when he got up was start doing his chores. He went to work. He went to the tabernacle like he normally would and as cheerfully as ever went and opened the doors. Verse 16 tells us, but then Eli summoned him, Samuel, my son. Samuel came running. Yes. What can I do for you? What did he say? Tell it to me, all of it. Don't suppress or soften one word. As God is your judge, I want it all, word for word, as he said it to you. So Samuel told him word for word, he held back nothing. Eli did not question whether Samuel was telling the truth or not. He was not angry with him, nor did he object to the justice of the sentence that was pronounced on him and his sons. He did not complain of the punishment but patiently submitted and accepted the punishment of his sins. Eli said, he is God. Let him do whatever he thinks best. His response showed his resigned acceptance of God's judgment because he knew he had sinned against God. What was Eli's sin? What did he do that would cause God to punish him so severely. His sons did some disgraceful sins and Eli knew about them and did nothing about it. He was father, high priest and judge, yet he chose to do nothing to them. Worse yet, they didn't hide their sins. They blatantly flaunted them. They defiled the sanctuary and he neglected his duty. So God brought these harsh conditions upon them. I'm reminded in Ezekiel chapter 3 verses 17 through 21 when God said when I say to a wicked man you will surely die and you do not warn him or speak out to dissuade him from his evil ways that wicked man will die for his sin and I will hold you accountable for his blood. You may be inclined to feel sorry for them especially Eli. He may have been a good man, but he knew the crimes of his son, but let them go unpunished. They essentially cursed themselves. They, they could have changed, but they had been doing their dirty deeds for so long that they didn't care. They had become hard and fast in their wrongdoings, even after their serious warning. They chose not to repent. And Eli, 
He was old and weak and almost blind, so in his weakness, he took no steps to defend himself from God, from what God had in store for them, and yes, even his family. It was as if he was saying at the stage, this stage of his life, it doesn't really matter. He doesn't even care what happened to him. But beloved, God calls all of us for a reason. And when he calls, we ought to take notice. You ought to listen when God speaks. He's better than E.F. Hutton. Sometimes it's a warning as to what is soon to come or even what has already happened. Sometimes it's a direction as if whether to go or to stay, whether the call is, whatever the call is. When God calls, you ought to stop and listen. Tune your ears to hear God's voice. Be so in tune to God's voice that even in the midst of all the other voices clamoring for your attention, God's voice will be the loudest voice, the clearest voice that you will ever hear. If you don't take the time to distinguish God's voice in the quiet moments of your life, it will be much harder to hear God in chaotic, chaotic moments of your life. God is calling someone today. He is saying, hear my voice, listen to my words. He is calling someone today. Can you hear his voice, church? He's trying to get your attention. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't harden your hearts against God's voice. Speak, Lord, for the people of Eastern Pennsylvania Annual Conference are listening. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen, amen, and amen.